you had your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11. This morning we're going to look at a very controversial issue that's going on, not only in our country, but in other countries. Other countries have already passed bills saying that you cannot minister to an individual with same-sex attraction. Uh, Canada is the most recent country that has done this. They started out with Bill C-4. Basically, criminalizing con conversion therapy. It has outlawed praying and spiritual counseling for individuals with unwanted same-sex attraction. That is even if someone in that lifestyle that they have chosen comes to you and asks you as a spiritual leader, would you help them? You are bound by law in Canada now that you cannot share the truth of God's Word. In effect, it, it silences the churches from preaching conversion through Jesus Christ and His forgiveness, which is the intended goal. The bad thing about critical race theory is critical race theory has no room for repentance and for forgiveness. And then we know as Christians that one of the basic foundational principles is simply that God forgives. Amen. We are all sinners, but we are saved by His grace through faith. <laughs> Somebody should have said amen. The, two weeks ago, when everybody did this, and John MacArthur did it, and everybody, uh, all the conservative Bible-believing preachers across the United States, Canada, and hopefully around the world, preached a sermon related to sexual immorality. They're doing this, and I'm doing it today because we had snow two weeks ago, but I'm doing it today in conjunction with them to say to our government and any government that God's word is absolute truth no matter what society may accept, no, no matter what law they may pass. And by the way, we have a law in the, in the Congress right now that's already passed Nancy Pelosi's uh, House of Representatives and went to the, comp, to the Senate, but they're blocking it right now, the Equality Act. If you want to see where our country's headed, you go and you read that bill. Sounds good, doesn't it? Equality. Everybody wants to be treated fairly. No, no doubt about that. But you read that bill and see what it does. It will actually cause a church to have to shut its doors as far as preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, I'm going to tell you, and I'm not up here bragging this morning, I'm not putting the target on my back, I'm just telling you the truth. As long as the God gives me breath in this body, I'm going to preach the absolute truth of God. We are told as pastors to preach the whole counsel of God to be ready in season and out of season, and that means to tell you this morning that I'm obligated to tell you the truth of God's Word, whether I like it or not. I don't have a choice. And so I'm here this morning to tell you what the absolute truth of God's Word is. We know that God forgives. And God forgives all sin. I want to read you a statement. Listen to this statement closely. Truthful statements can be presented in a manner that would meet the definition of hate speech. And not all truthful statements must be free from restriction. Did you get that? Not all truthful statements must be free from restriction. The First Amendment to the Constitution says we have the freedom of speech. Now, I don't agree with the Muslims. I don't agree with Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, but I will stand up with them and say, you have the right to say what you believe. I totally disagree with their theology all the way around at every point. But they have the right to say it because that's what the Constitution has granted us. The statement continues. The benefits of the suppression of hate speech. My question is who determines what is hate speech? The benefits of the suppression of hate speech and its harmful effects 
outweigh the detrimental effect of restricting expression, which, by its nature, does little to promote the values underlying freedom of expression. You see how in that one statement, let me, let me finish this out. This was done by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2013, Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission versus Watcock. Case number 33676, in case you think I'm blowing air this morning. This is reality. This is what we are facing in our country. What they have de de decided in Canada and already in France is that man's word is greater than God's word. And you must obey man's word and not God's word. And the Bible teaches us that anything that is contrary to God is of the devil. Amen. And we need to stand this morning on what we believe about what the Bible says in every area. Deliverance from immoral sexuality. Freedom to preach biblical truth. That's why I'm here this morning. I'm not getting down on any sect of people because we're going to cover ten different classes. And I'm not getting down on any of them individually. I'm getting down on all of them as a whole because that's what the Bible does. Preaching biblical truth is a, it is a command from God, not a concession to the government. Are we going to stand on biblical truth? Amen. If you found your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, would you please stand with me? Starting with verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Here is the linchpin that puts, that puts doubt in the face of the government and puts truth in the face of the government. Listen to what this next verse says. And such were some of you, but... You were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Conversion does happen. There is not a person in this place this morning that has not been converted by the Holy Spirit of God. You were a former sinner. And you have been saved by grace. And that principle that God forgives if you repent applies to every sin that the Bible mentions and that includes homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, cross-dressing and whatever else you, you, you want to put into it. It's all grouped into one thing. There is no doubt in the Bible that every time this is mentioned, six times, Three in the old, three in the new. Every time this subject is brought up, the Bible condemns it. There's no allowance for it. Brother Bart, would you pray for us this morning? We look at our text this morning. Paul is talking to a bunch of Christians <coughs> who have got the nerve to take each other to court to settle social issues. So this is the context that we're looking at. He said in verse 2, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world would be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? He says you should not be taking your brother and sister to court in front of pagan people to settle a spiritual issue. They don't think like you think. They don't act like you act because they don't have the Spirit of God dwelling within them. So, because something is accepted as true does not make it true. Because society says that something is acceptable and right does not make it right with God because God has never changed Amen. and never will change. 
I prayed about this thing for two weeks before I, I decided on 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And I wanted to use this passage because, in my opinion, it debunks conversion therapy. Now, I know, okay, I've read all the, all the articles and stuff on this thing. I know that there are techniques that are used in an effort to convert people that are harmful. You should never brainwash people. You shouldn't beat them to death with it. Uh, you shouldn't just pile guilt on and guilt on on top of somebody else that's having a bad day. They have a mental handicap anyway. So what we need to do is pray for these people and be compassionate to them. But we need to tell the truth. <coughs> what is more useful to a person than to tell them the truth, the Bible says in, in Isaiah, to snatch a brand out of the fire, or tell them, it's okay, go ahead, you know, uh, everybody accepts it now. That's not love. That's not compassion. <clears throat> Notice how Paul sets his case up here. Starting in verse 9. Look at Paul's concern in verse 9. Look at his uh, uh, interrogative. He says, don't you know? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The word not know or the phrase occurs six times in this chapter. This is the third time that, that it has occurred. And it indicates that they already had this knowledge. Paul has already dealt with them on this, on, on this, uh, on this issue. Corinth was one of the most secular, permissive societies that there was during this time. Anything went. Everything was okay. They had a God, to every God. Nothing was, 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 was limited as far as their lifestyles went. And Paul says, you church members, you already know this. I don't need to be telling you. He said, you know. You already have this knowledge. And what, what's he talking about? Is individuals, the unrighteous. The word unrighteous there speaks of those lacking the imputed righteousness of faith and those who do injustice to others. In other words, he's talking to professors, not possessors within the church. You understand what I'm talking about? He's talking about people who claim to be Christian, but were not living like Christians. Amen. And he said, you unrighteous people who claim the name of Jesus, want the benefits of going to heaven and living a good life, he said, you are in danger because you've allowed your mind to be blinded by the secular <laughs> society uh, in which you live. And he said, because of that, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. The inheritance there simply, uh, 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 the word inherit simply means oh, absolute not. It's with absolute negative. No doubt about this. Paul's not wishy-washy. He's not straddling the fence. He said you absolutely will not inherit, will not enter into full possession of. We already have, in a sense, the kingdom of God living within us. If you're saved and, and Christ is ruling and reigning in your life and you're submitting to Him and trying to grow spiritually, then the kingdom of God is alive in your heart. But there's a sense when Paul is looking at the kingdom as the eschatological or the end times inheritance that will be the reward for all true believers. So that's what he's talking about. You will not inherit the kingdom, the spiritual sphere of salvation where God rules and reigns. He said, if you have a lifestyle that is continually in this manner with these ten, ten sins, he said, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Simply put, because the instruction is that you've been deceived. Notice, present passive imperative. This is a command. He says, don't let the world in which you live, don't let the people you listen to or the people you associate with or a government or a medical association tell you that the Bible is wrong when it comes to certain issues and that they're right and they've got more authority over your life than God has over your life and they have they do not have the authority over your life because they did not save you they did not uh, forgive you of your sins and they did not tell you that you were on your way to heaven they can't guarantee that God can Amen. and because God has saved my soul I am obligated to live a holy life I don't want to be mean today, but I want to be up front. And I want to be fact of the matter, okay? 
and I know I get to talking and get boisterous and loud sometimes. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to get you to understand that we're facing a dilemma in our society when people are saying that the government is greater than God, and it is not. He says, don't be deceived. That means that you can be deceived. You can buy into the false narratives that's going around. You can buy into the false medical reports uh, that, that says certain things are okay and certain things are not. No, it's not. God has never changed his mind. He is immutable. Amen. You go all the way back to Genesis when sin first started. God's always had a hatred of sin and a hostility towards sin. And he is going to judge that sin one day. So, now he gives the characteristics Ten characteristics he's going to list here. And we're not going to get into a big definition of all of them because it would take a couple hours. But what I wanted to want you to know is simply this. Every one of us has committed some of these sins. Amen. Every one of us. And a society, listen to me, a society that accepts alternative lifestyles is in the danger of God's judgment. That goes for abortion. That goes for homosexuality. And this transgenderism that's taken us by storm. When you've got school teachers telling little boys and girls that you, you know you're not a boy, you can be a girl if you want to, behind the parents' back, ought to stop. Amen. Somebody's got to stand up, folks. First of all, he talks about immoral sexual behavior. Notice what he says there. He starts off with fornicators, indulging in sexual activity outside of marriage. All you unmarried people, all you young teenagers or getting about, about to be teenagers, this is talking to you. I'm told that teachers now can't control bathrooms. When we were little, they went in the bathroom with you. And now you can't patrol it in a high school? Be serious. You're just asking for trouble. It says idolaters worship a false god, but then it refers here in this context to temple prostitutes. In a pagan society, there were people who thought they could offer themselves to the god by, by committing sexual acts with others who came to the temple to worship, and that, was, that earned them points with their god, that appeased their god. Paul said, no, can't do that either. He says, you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. You shouldn't give yourself as a temple prostitute to some pagan god. And then he says, you adulterers. Oh, oh, that hurt, didn't it? Adulterers. We'll overlook adultery in the church and condemn everything else. That's right. We'll let an affair go on in the church as long as you don't say anything about it. That should be confronted just like anything else. I don't care if it's a deacon or a pastor. How many pastors do you know that have failed in the ministry because they got involved with another woman? Shouldn't do it. Adulterers. Those who are engaged in sexual acts outside of marriage. That covers everybody, don't it? That pretty much covers it. And then, not to leave them out, he said... Homosexuals. There are two words in the Greek language that are used here. This one is arsenokoitex. Uh, uh, and it means a man who lies with another man. Now I could go back to Exodus. I could go to Leviticus and Numbers and show you that every time this is mentioned, it's talking about sexual relations between two men. The Bible condemns it. Now what I want to get across to you is this. The Bible doesn't condemn that any worse than it does adultery. Hello? See, a lot of people in the church used to want to have their little affairs on the side and then come to church on Sunday morning and sing in the choir and worship. You think God's happy with something like that? Absolutely not. And I'm going to tell you this morning, standing on the back of the dime, we're going to confront sin in the church. We're not going to let it go on. Then he talked about another homosexual, sodomite. The word literally means soft to the touch. Those who allow themselves to be used in a homosexual act. And what he's talking about is the effeminate. 
Why would Paul use two words to do this? Because in the Roman society at that time, it was okay if a man sought out a homosexual relationship, but it was not okay for a man to be used by a homosexual. You see how perverted they were? When the mind of a human being gets so perverted that they say that homosexuals and sodomites are okay in society and they glorify it and they lift them up, they are so blinded that they cannot see spiritual truth, period. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. And so I don't leave anybody out in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Paul talked about lesbians, women, doing the same thing the men were doing. Paul's covered everybody here. So no, I'm not getting down on homosexuals today. They need help. Adulterers, they need help. Because they're all in sin and they're all in danger, as far as I read scripture, of hell fire. And Paul just said you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God because of this continual behavior. Do you realize that six of the Ten Commandments are broken in this list of sins? Next part, improper social behavior. And he gets everybody. Paul's pretty, pretty, pretty fair, isn't he? Notice what he says. You thieves, one who steals openly. You covetous, one who <laughs> desires to have more. The drunkards denotes habitual intoxication. Now, medical science has taken this, and they use the term alcoholic, and they say there's a cause for it, and they try to pacify it. The Bible says it's a sin, and God judges sin, and a, a drunk is going to be held accountable just like a druggie or anybody else. Now, if that makes you mad, I'm sorry. Go on, put your beer up. Get rid of your alcohol. Because we will allow that in the church too. Won't say nothing about it. <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to be mean. Revilers, people who try to destroy others with words. Man, this hits the church hard, doesn't it? People drinking and carousing in the church, people backbiting and stabbing and talking and gossiping about everything that goes on. Paul said you shouldn't do it because if you do that in a habitual manner, you're showing that you're not saved and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a warning to every one of us, folks. Extortioners, swindlers, embezzlers who steal indirectly. The old joke used to be <laughs> used car dealers. You know, you couldn't go by a used car because they could steal you, you know, cheat you blind. Steal you blind, so... Um, in business, you know, how do you treat people? Do you treat them fairly or do you take advantage of every situation that you get? Judas was a thief. Barabbas was a thief. Zacchaeus was a thief. But God forgave him, didn't he? All but Judas. And Judas didn't come seeking repentance. And then look at the insistence. Again, it says in that verse that they will not, absolutely will not, inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because lifestyles that exhibit wickedness, not fruit, show that they are not saved. That's why I said to you earlier, we're talking about people in the church who claim to be saved who are not truly saved. Now, can Christians fall into these ten sins? Absolutely. And I would say some of us probably have. But a Christian will immediately be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God. We will turn away from that sin and do their best not to fall back into that trap again. Because Satan knows where you're weak. And Satan wants to hurt you. And that's what he does. Okay, this is the bad stuff. You take a deep breath. Whew, I'm glad he's done with that. Now, to get the good stuff. Here's why I would argue with anybody, doctor, lawyer, philosopher, conversion is possible. Look at the clarification that Paul says in verse 11. He says, some, some of you, they needed reminding of their past and what God had done for them. Do you need to be reminded where you came from? 
I don't say you should live and dwell on your past, but you should look back every now and then and say, thank God that I'm not what I was before you saved me. Now, I thank God that you have saved me, you have drawn me to you, you hold me close to your bosom, you let me feel your love and your grace and your mercy, and I am here because of what you did in my life, not what the government has done. And in that phrase it says there, and such word, the word word is an imperfect tense word, and what that means is action that was going on in the past. So Paul is saying, in your past life, some of you were these things. You were thieves. You were tattlers, backbiters. You were people who stole. You were, you were people who were mean to each other. He said, but... Look at that word. What's the next word? And some uh, and, and such were some of you. Say it with me. But, ah, uh, strong contrast in the Greek language. Why would Paul use that? Because he's making and marking out the contrast and difference between a truly saved person and a person who's never known the love and the joy of God and the joy of salvation. These are all aorist tense verbs, which means it's something that happened one time in history. Friends, you got saved one time. You don't need to get saved over and over and get baptized until you, until you draw up like a prayer. You don't need to look like that. All you need to do is make one solid connection to God, answer God's call to salvation, and you're saved for eternity. Look at the cleansing. Look at the cleansing. I started to use conversion here because this is an absolute text that goes against the theory that people cannot be converted from lifestyles. Paul just said some of y'all were all these things, including homosexuals, transgenders, lesbians. He said some of y'all were, but you came out of that lifestyle. How? By the divine power and authority of Almighty God and the accomplished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Amen. This one verse is all you need to know about being saved. It is, the, it is the total picture of redemption. It says you were washed. It refers to the initial act of salvation. Regeneration by the Spirit. Not talking about baptism. Baptism just wrecks you. It is an ordinance that you can follow Jesus in baptism as a sign of obedience to what he's done in your life. But it just wets you. This is talking about the initial act when the Holy Spirit came upon you. He convicted you of your sin. He convinced you of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you confessed and called on the name of the Lord and you were saved. Amen. Amen. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. I'm free from that burden. I'm free from that sin because of what Jesus did. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then it says you were sanctified, set apart by the Spirit, uh, by, uh, that is, uh, by the Holy Spirit of God for holy living. You are not living your Christian life. It is Jesus that is living His life out through you so that you can be an example and a witness to those around you. And all of these happened at one time. All three of these happened simultaneously at the, uh, at the moment that you got saved. You were washed. Free from that burden, that guilt was lifted. You were sanctified. You were set apart. This is the initial act of sanctification when God calls you a saint, a holy one. Remember when he called Gideon? The angel came up to him. He had never seen this angel. And the angel said, Oh, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. God already knew what he was. Gideon just didn't know. And see, when God looks at you, he calls you a saint, a holy one, a one set apart for God's purpose. You may not act like it, talk like it, look like it, but in God's eyes, he has set you apart for time and for eternity, and nothing can bring you back out of it. You've been washed, you've been sanctified, and then you've been justified, declared acquitted, not innocent, can I get an amen? amen? Not innocent because I sin. I fail every day. But I have in God's eyes and in God's judgment house, I have been acquitted because of the blood of Jesus. And I have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been imputed to my account and God's righteousness outweighs my sin every single time. Lastly, and I'll finish. I know you'll Probably going like God, man. Come on. Lastly, it says, "In the name, how was this done? The name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. The name, the authority of divine power. 
The Bible says, Neither is there any other name given among heaven among given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved. It says at the sound of that name, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Jesus said, My mission on earth was to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Because of what he did that makes me safe today. Secondly, the Spirit is the agency of divine power. Titus 3, 5 talks about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit of God. John 16 tells you that the Holy Spirit convicts you and convinces you and converts you to make you a Christian. But Jesus said you must be born again. Jesus weren't just putting out words. He was telling you the truth. You've got to be born of the Holy Spirit of God. And then lastly, it says the Spirit of God. God is the author of all redemption. He is the original and He is the origin of all redemption because it goes all the way back again to Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve had sinned, God killed the first sacrifice. God covered the first sin looking forward to the cross of Calvary when Jesus would not cover sin anymore but He takes it away completely. <coughs> And once it's taken away, that's it. The tritheism, Jesus, the Spirit, and God the Father are all involved in your salvation. I believe in the eternal security of the believer. John says in his gospel that there's no one greater than God and nobody can take you out of God's hand. <laughs> Not even yourself. And I would ask you today, are you saved? I'm not talking about you, your name on the church roll. I'm not talking about you being a faithful member. I'm not talking about good people. I'm talking about if you had a personal heart to heart, soul to soul encounter with Almighty God. Had you known and faced up that I am a sinner, that I need forgiveness, that I need salvation, that I need redemption, and I need Jesus in my life. That's the difference in your eternal destiny. It determines where you will spend eternity. Time is short. Hell is hot. And eternity is long. Father, Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts this morning. Father, if need be, you've brought conviction. If not, Father, I pray that you've encouraged us, that you give us the courage to stand on the unmutable, the unchangeable word of the living God, a word that changes lives forever. Father, help us today to submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.